Since 1993, the Harn Eminent Scholar Chair in Art History, HESCA, has offered opportunities to engage with scholars and thinkers on the cutting edge of current scholarship in art history. Established by a gift from Dr. David A. and Mary Ann Coffrin, HESCA allows us to invite distinguished scholars whose work represents a range of fields in the history of art. We're very grateful for that gift and the lectures that it makes possible. Tonight, we have the real pleasure of welcoming Dr. D Dr. Mary Coffey to the University of Florida. Dr. Coffey is professor of art history at Dartmouth College, where she specializes in the history of modern Mexican visual culture, with an emphasis on Mexican muralism and the politics of exhibition. As many of you might know, our HESCA lectures are often tethered in one way or another to the courses that we teach, and tonight's lecture is no exception. I'm currently teaching a senior seminar on the history of art in Mexico City, and Dr. Coffey seemed like a perfect interlocutor for such a course as she stands out as one of the most insightful scholars on the arts of modern Mexico. Her first book, How a Revolutionary Art Became Official Culture, Murals, Museums, and the Mexican State, was published in 2012 by Duke University Press. The book carefully maps the connections between art and politics in post-revolutionary Mexico. It I think it's a triumph of a book, and I am not alone in thinking so. It was awarded the College Art Association's Charles Rufus Mori Award for a Distinguished Book in Art History for 2012. My students will have the chance to wade deeply into this book in just a few short weeks. Her second book, which continued her exploration of Mexican muralists, led her from Mexico City to Dartmouth College, which is home to Jose Clemente Orozco's monumental mural cycle entitled Epic of American Civilization. In 2020, Coffee published Orozco's American Epic, Myth, History, and the Melancholy of Race, also with Duke University Press. It is a worthy follow-up to her first book, and one that shows how much can be gained by delving deeply into an artwork as complex as Orozco's mural cycle. A quick survey of her CV reveals that she's not been limited to only these two major lines of inquiry. She's been a prolific scholar throughout her career, having published almost 20 articles and essays in journals and edited volumes, and she seems to have made the rare, she seems to have the rare talent of being able to cover a wide array of topics, all with equal insight. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Coffey share new research related to the Mexican muralist Jose Clemente Orozco and prints rather than mural paintings, which raise pressing issues of great relevance still today. Her talk tonight is entitled At the Edge of Whiteness, Brown Feeling, and the Public Life of Blackness in Jose Clemente Orozco's U.S.-based prints. I know I speak for all of us when I say that I'm excited to hear what she has in store for us tonight. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Mary Coffey. Thanks, Derek, and thank you so much for coming. And I want to thank um, Vivian Lantau, Bob Todd, who also helped me get here. This is my first public talk since the pandemic, so it's kind of a strange to be back in this um, in this place. Uh, and as you heard, I, I publish a lot on muralism in my second book really became a book that was as much about Mexico City and Mexican cultural politics as it was about what happens to artists when they come to the United States from Mexico and they live here for quite some time and begin to grapple with what America means from this place as opposed to that place. And that book is really about that transnational journey. And while writing that, I became incre incredibly interested in Orozco's prints, which I had taught them to my students. And that's where this project sort of started. Before I begin, I do want to just note the warning. I hope you've all seen it. Um, in this talk, I will be uh, showing at least um, one, two works that are works of art based on a very graphic lynching photograph. I will not be showing the photograph. I will not be showing any lynching photography. Um, however, uh, that these works of art, while aestheticized and abstracted, certainly conjure the photograph. Uh, I will also periodically use language that is in my sources. In this period in the United States, it was commonplace for all people um, thinking about race to use the word Negro, so it does show up. Uh, and I do make brief reference to Carl Van Vechten's infamous novel, um, which is um, has a racial slur in its title, which I don't use, but it is referenced in the paper. So uh, I just want you to know that's coming. I don't want anyone to be taken by surprise. And of course, if it's something that you're not interested in seeing or thinking about tonight, 
understandably, <laughs> you can go. Um, uh, all right, so um, my remarks today, as I just indicated, are part of a project on the Mexican artist Jose Clemente Orozco's print production. Uh, he began experimenting with lithography during his second and longest stay in the United States between 1928 and 1934. And the two prints that I'm going to discuss tonight were his first and last. So the first print I'll be discussing was the first lithograph he ever made. Uh, it happened in the United States in New York as part of the sort of radical print revival that was going on in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And the last print that I'm going to be discussing is the last print he made in the United States uh, before leaving. So the first print uh, is titled Teatro de Variedades in Harlem, also sometimes known as Vaudeville in Harlem. I use the Spanish title because the variety theater is more um, uh, accurate than the term vaudeville. Uh, and this is a print, of course, that offers us a view of animated bodies performing on a Harlem stage. His last print is entitled Negros, also Negros Cocados or Hanged Black Men. And this images a gruesome lynching uh, uh, in both of these prints, Orozco focuses on spectacles of performance and pain that were broadly associated with blackness in the United States. The fact that he's treating these two subjects, which we tend to think of as separate in our minds, entertainment spectacle and the lynching, the spectacle of lynching, in, in this kind of short period of time in the United States, I think offers us a unique perspective on race relations in the United States in this period. Now, Jean Charlot, uh, a Mexican artist and historian, documented Orozco's experiments with lithography when he published their correspondence from these years. And Orozco's oldest son, who's known as Clemente Orozco, it's a little confusing, also published a quasi-catalogue raisonné in which most of these prints have been reproduced along with brief descriptions and some print information about the print runs. But only Ana Indich Lopez has explored Orozco's prints with any scholarly depth in her book, Muralism Without Walls. Her focus there is on how the demands of US collectors and a burgeoning private system of museum and gallery exhibition impacted Orozco's subject matter as he converted drawings of the horrors of the revolution into more anodyne and thus marketable lithographs. Indich Lopez's argument has been salutary for my own as she poses questions about how living and working in the United States altered the politics and production of Mexican artists. Today, I'll approach that question from a slightly different standpoint. Scholars like Ana Indich Lopez and Ted Cohen taught us a lot about how cosmopolitan intellectuals such as Diego Rivera, Orozco, Miguel Covarrubias, and others brought the cultural politics of the post-revolutionary Renaissance to their US American careers. And they've demonstrated how these artists interacted with and influenced artists in the United States, in particular artists associated with the Harlem Renaissance, and more broadly, those on the left. But in their scholarship, there's a tendency to treat Mexican artists as stable subjects, whose racial, ethnic, or national identity as mestizos was fixed and therefore unaffected by their sojourns north of the border. While these scholars attend to how Mexican artists negotiated the expectations of their US patrons and publics with regard to their Mexicanness, they sometimes reproduce the normative construction of mestizo identity as post-racial and position it as functionally akin to the unmarked category of whiteness in the United States. I question this tendency uh, to treat these artists as default white subjects without attending to the period politics of whiteness and thinking critically about how their Mexicanness might have been read and thereby felt with respect to the US color line. In what is admittedly a speculative argument, I ask we consider more carefully how their US-based work might offer insights about their situated responses to an evolving understanding of race and identity as they navigated that color line. In this presentation and the essay upon which it is based, I undertake the fraught pro this fraught project with regard to the artists who's least explored in this extant literature, but whose work I think offers us some of the most compelling opportunities to explore what the late performance studies scholars Jose Munoz called a sense of brown. <clears throat> Teatro de Variedades in Harlem offers the viewer an unusual perspective of Harlem's much lauded nightlife. Orozco situates the viewer in the back of an ornate theater. An arch supported by a column frames the upper limit of our view of the stage where a contortionist bends their rubbery body into a spiral of curved lines. <clears throat> 
To either side, we see shadowy figures with blocky, indistinct bodies flinging their arms in the air while seemingly hopping up and down. Our view of the performance is partially obstructed, and the audience, who take up more than half of the composition, seem at least as important as the performers on stage. They face forward, their heads are silhouetted against the white light, eradicating any individual features, except for two men who stand behind the seating area and to the left of the column. These two here. One wears the bowler hat, a bowler hat and has an angular profile like those of the many businessmen that Orozco depicted at this time hustling through the city's frigid streets. And the other is bareheaded with a rounded profile which may reflect period prescriptions regarding black features. The seating on either side of the theater parts at the center, forming an illuminated aisle that channels the eye towards the stage. And a preliminary drawing reveals that Orozco viewed the instruments in the pit and the elastic body of the contortionist as a formal unit, circumscribed by a compositional circle. The seating, central aisle, and ocular target at the heart of the composition can be understood as a cataract that uses light and line to narrow and then dilate the view as our gaze moves from the back of the theater toward the stage. And in this way, Orozco formally reinforces the act of viewing that he thematizes iconographically through the seated and standing spectators. His composition thereby implicates the viewer in the relay between the audience and the eccentric bodies on the stage. Now, despite the exuberance implied by the show, Orozco's print exudes a depressive affect that deviates from most renderings of Harlem's clubs and theaters from the period. In his monograph on Orozco's print oeuvre, his oldest son ascribes racial meaning uh, to this tension. Here he writes, quote, America is shown as the great theater of radical contrasts in the bright light, the contorted black figures, and in the dark, the rigid white figures, end quote. I take his assertion that U.S. America is a great theater as a point of departure, arguing that his insight bears upon more than just the pictorial scene. It acknowledges the extent to which race and ethnicity, as Jose Munoz suggests, are performative with affect rather than biology or physiology as their key register. Munoz elaborates that race is not fixed, obviously something that people are, but rather something that people do and feel. When Orozco's son associates the rigidity of the spectators in his print with whiteness, he anticipates what Munoz would describe as the flat and impoverished affect of white normativity. Likewise, when he contrasts this rigidity with the animation of what he identifies as the black figures on stage, Orozco's son draws upon long-standing stereotypes that associate people of color with wild or unrefined behavior according to middle-class white standards of bodily and emotional control. However, I argue due to the dramatic lighting effects within Orozco's scene, neither the figures on stage nor those watching the show are described with enough detail to firmly identify them as black or white. Moreover, assumptions about the racial identity of the audience are further complicated by the artist's own point of view. For formal and iconographic cues in his print situate the viewing subject as a spectator located within the theater, but standing at the outer edges of the scene. This not only raises sociological questions about who sat or stood where in Harlem's theaters, but also affective ones about the psychological experience this position on the margins both registers and produces. If we are witnessing the color line so neatly demarcated between spectacle and spectator, where might we locate the Mexican artist, racially, spatially, psychologically, who affords us this view? To the extent that Orozco explores race then, I suggest it is brownness that he conjures, not as an objectified visible or historical identity, but rather as a feeling that is produced in relation to what Munoz calls the public life of blackness. Following Munoz's theorizing of Latinx drama and queer performance, I treat Orozco's lithograph as a symbolic act of ethnic difference, carried out within a representational sphere dominated by middle class predominantly white artists looking at black bodies performing or in pain. Orozco's point of view within Teatro de Variedades implicates the viewer, challenging us to identify the exaggerated performance on stage and to locate ourselves physically within the theatrical space and affectively with regard to the audience members gazing at these eccentric bodies. Teatro de Variedades in Harlem signals a concern with black life that emerged in Orozco's art during his two stays in the United States. 
Reference to the global struggle for black liberation appears in his public mural cycle at the New School for Social Research in New York City, which he painted between 1930 and 31. And at Dartmouth College, where he was from 1932 to 34, he explored the relational racialization of black and brown people in this panel entitled Modern Industrial Man. But anti-black racism comes to the fore in the last lithograph he completed before leaving for Mexico in 1934. Entitled Negroes, this print refers to the widely publicized and brutal lynching of George Hughes in Texas that inspired many artists during the apex of the anti-lynching movement in the 1930s. With their focus on the popular entertainments of Harlem nightlife and the brutalities of lynching in the West, Orozco's first and last US American prints are more explicit about racialized spectacle than his public mural commissions allowed. Orozco's exploration of the public life of blackness took place during what scholars refer to as the Nader era in US race relations. This period from roughly the 1890s to the 1940s is notable for an open adherence to white supremacy reflected in imperial expansion, Jim Crow segregation, immigration restriction, lynchings, and forced deportations, to name only a few. When Orozco first came to the United States in 1917, uh, the Mexican Revolution was coming to an end, but tensions between Mexican and US forces remained high, especially in Texas, where raids and counter raids across the border resulted in a period of anti-Mexican violence known as La Mantanza, or the massacre, roughly between the period of 1910 and 1920, that claimed the lives of as many as 5,000 Mexicans and Mexican Americans living in the United States. Hoping to find opportunity in the United States, he crossed the border at Laredo, Texas, where he was detained by border guards who eventually released him, but only after confiscating and destroying over 30 of his paintings, which they deemed indecent for their depictions of nudes. He then traveled to San Francisco, where he ended up working as a commercial rather than a fine artist. And in 1919, before he left uh, for New York City, or he left for New York City, but he took a detour into Canada to see Niagara Falls, where he reports he was forcibly expelled by policemen for being Mexican. Mexican and bandito, he writes, sardonically were synonymous. Once in New York City, he marveled at the city's sights and sounds, noting in particular Harlem, quote, where Negroes and Spanish Americans live, end quote. In these observations, he touches upon key features of race in America that are salient in this discussion. First, he relays the criminalization of Mexicans as bandits, a phenomenon that the artist and scholar Ken Gonzalez Day has shown derives from the 19th century consolidation of Anglo-American identity after the Mexican-American War. Second, Orozco acknowledges Spanish Americans living in East Harlem, an index of the transnational character of this racial enclave that was home to not only black nationals, but also Trinidadians, Jamaicans, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans. As a Mexican, Orozco was situated ambiguously within the racial politics of the East Coast, where a black-white dichotomy structured notions of racial categorization and where whiteness as a marker of belonging was synonymous with Anglo-American identity, despite the fact that the category was expanding to encompass ethnic Europeans in response to the influx of African-Americans from the South and Afro-Latinos from the Caribbean. Now, alternatively in Mexico, mestizaje or race mixing, typically understood as a mixture between Spanish or European and indigenous descent, was becoming the dominant trope of normative racial identity and the mestizo, not whiteness, was upheld as the national ideal. In influential texts like La Raza Cosmica, Jose Vasconcelos, um, uh, who's the author of this book, The Cosmic Race, um, uh, the ideology of mestizaje was promoted as a form of anti-racism leveraged against the Anglocentrism of the United States. For as Vasconcelos emphatically claimed, quote, they committed the sin of destroying those races, by which he was referring to Indians and Blacks, while we assimilated them, end quote. Now, contemporary scholars have made clear that mestizo normativity, like whiteness, is predicated on anti-Blackness. It is also a post-racial ideology that perpetuates the idea that Mexico is a raceless society and denies the fact of racism, viewing it instead as a pathology exclusive to the United States, but in this period, it's becoming a kind of dominant uh, identity that is understood by the people who adopt it to be implicitly anti-racist. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it sort of upholds this idea that uh, um, being Mexican or being a mestizo is not being white. So 
Whereas in Mexico, laying claim to mestizo identity was a desirable expression of national belonging, in the United States, it positioned one as a quote unquote mongrel and thereby a person of color. Orozco as a light-skinned, highly educated middle-class man would have understood himself within the post-racial ideology of mestizaje to be a non-colored person. And thus it must have come as quite a shock to find that when on the other side of the border, his Mexicanness was periodically read as a racialized, criminalized, or sexual threat to European descended populations who understood themselves to be white. In a subsequent publication titled Bolivarismo y Monorismo, Bolivarism and Monroeism, Vasconcelos continued to promote mestizaje, but now as an antidote to the growing threat of global white supremacy. In his excoriating critique of anti-Latin racism in the United States, he warns his light-skinned peers of the perils of assuming white privilege. In one particularly relevant passage, he writes, quote, the super white criollos of our content tend to smirk at North American racial distinctions, believing that they are beyond the reach of the metric that is applied to the Indians, the rule that affects the Chinese and the blacks. If the occasion allows, they will learn right away that light skin bestows a rank that lasts only as long as their pesos. The instant they search for work, they will learn that racism places the Spaniard in a similar category as the Berber, end quote. Vasconcelos' warning could easily describe Orozco's experience in the United States where he enjoyed both the relative mobility of light-skinned elites from Latin America and periods of racial stigmatization and financial precarity that located him on the margins of middle-class white respectability and privilege. And in his letters to Charlotte and in his writings in his autobiography, he comments quite a lot on how um, infuriated he is at the ways in which he is racialized in the United States and the kinds of performances of Mexicanness he feels he's expected um, uh, to um, uh, uh, do. Now, Orozco's second uh, sojourn, um, which was from 1920 to 34, would prove to be a turning point in his career. So his first trip, not so good, went back to Mexico, comes back in 28, and his career really takes off at this point. It's during this stay that he inaugurated uh, his work in lithography, which was a medium he enjoyed both as a site of experimentation and as a means of generating income to offset his less lucrative career in public art. Of the 18 lithographs he produced while living in the United States, the majority emphasized the suffering of Mexico's rural peasantry. Thus, Teatro de Variedades in Harlem and Negroes are outliers within this body of work. His emergent interest in black themes recalls that the leftist print revival in New York City was entangled with period struggles against racism. But as Helen Langa has shown, artists' desire to fight racism in the United States was obfuscated by period ideas about the innate racial differences between whites and people of color. Thus, even when praising the work of African-American artists, critics emphasize its supposedly Negro characteristics. Likewise, as Ana Indich Lopez has shown, Mexican artists also experience this kind of racialized essentialism. Moreover, the art world was segregated with groups like the Harmon Foundation promoting Negro art in racially exclusive exhibitions and only a few gallerists offering representation for African-American artists alongside their white colleagues. The same could be said for Mexican artists who enjoyed the support of cultural brokers like Anita Brenner and Alma Reed, but whose work was often displayed in exhibitions restricted to Mexican art. While white artists uh, and artists of color did work together on civil rights initiatives, they generally lived in geographically and racially segregated communities. So black artists tend to live and congregate in Harlem. Ethnic white artists tended to live and congregate on the Lower East Side. Orozco lived on the West Side. From there, he visited museums and galleries by day and recalls taking long walks up and down the river, quote, and into the many theaters, cabarets, and dancing halls of the immense district of Harlem by night, end quote. It's not surprising then that in his first crack at lithography, he tried to capture the experience of being in one such venue. Now, scholars of Variety Theater and its successor vaudeville note that this form of theatrical entertainment dates to the mid-19th century when performances that might have been experienced separately were strung together in a rapid sequence and presented over several hours for the purposes of low-cost leisure uh, and not edification. As a form of low-cost popular entertainment, Variety Theater was on a continuum with other amusements that appealed to the immigrant working classes often through spectacles of racial or bodily difference that at once othered the performers while implicitly elevating their spectators. And a kind of classic example of this would be 
something like William Glackids's representation of vaudevillians backstage dressing up in their characters of lizard and frogmen. And he shows them backstage kind of working, giving people the impression that these are, this is a kind of labor, uh, a kind of creative labor uh, that um, uh, kind of elevates the, the nuts, if they were, as they were referred to, nut acts, to something kind of laudable. Uh, uh, this is a slightly earlier moment in this phenomenon. Uh, Orozco uh, focuses our attention on a contortionist, one of many of these nut acts on, uh, who often adopted animal personae, such as lizard men and frog men, et cetera. In the 20th century, as vaudeville sought respectability and to attract assimilated white identified middle class consumers, the theaters got bigger, performance got, performances got shorter, and the acts were standardized. And under pressure from other forms of mass entertainment, vaudeville was effectively dead by the 1930s. Thus, Orozco's lithograph is somewhat anachronistic. His designation of Harlem as the locale is significant, therefore, because it locates the theater in a part of the city that was famed for its nightlife, but also less segregated than venues in other parts of Manhattan and to some extent less regulated. As you'll recall, Orozco's son identifies the figures on the stage as black because they are contorted. And indeed, both the jumping figures and the contortionists perform an animatedness that Sian Nye argues functions as a marker of racial or ethnic otherness in popular culture. Just as a classic example, people know this image. This is a famous sheet music for a minstrel show that shows the white men, male actors, sort of all standing kind of properly in their suits, and then above them in their minstrel characters, where you can see that the animated nature of the bodies is, the, is one of the ways in which this racial distinction is being performed and marked. Um, so Nye's thinking about this kind of um, um, history. She traces animatedness through representations of African and Asian Americans to demonstrate how excessive emotions attributed to people of color easily, quote, slide into corporeal qualities, reinforcing the idea that race is a truth located in the always obvious and highly visible body, end quote. However, while Orozco associates the animated frogman with the eccentric performance of the contortionist, he avoids the physiognomic features um, that might locate race on the body. Instead, he draws our attention to animatedness itself as a defining feature of spectacularized racial performance. Now, as Orozco was executing his lithograph, a debate over black entertainment was being waged between an earlier generation of writers in the New Negro movement who promoted racial uplift and a younger group of writers known as the Cabaret School who challenged the civil rights establishment. Shane Vogel argues that their debate was spurred by the publication of Carl Van Vechten's controversially titled N-Word Heaven. Van Vechten took a colloquial phrase for Harlem as a whole and redeployed it as a descriptor of the segregated balconies in its theaters. And despite the, his claim that he intended to subvert racial hierarchy, he also admitted that he used a racial slur in the title to draw attention um, the attention of white readers and pique their interest in Harlem's nightlife. The animated stereotypes of blackness that Van Vechten promoted are evident in the visual culture produced by artists who were enthralled by the Negro Vogue and inspired by his book. For example, Miguel Covarrubias's Negro drawings, which were exhibited as a suite and published in 1927 to great acclaim. Uh, in this portfolio, it, uh, there's a preface by Ralph Barton of Vanity Fair in which he cites Van Vechten's novel to endorse Covarrubias' drawings. Barton equates Covarrubias with prehistoric man and his subjects with the animals that he stalked. So this kind of backhanded praise typifies the extent to which both Mexicans and African Americans were subjected to primitivizing white, the primitivizing white gaze during these overlapping vogues between the Mexican and the Negro vogue. Covarrubias's portfolio is divided into five sections that reveal that variety theater, vaudeville, and jazz cabarets, as well as African-Americans, Afro-Cubans, were linked in the minds of artists that were captivated by Harlem's nightlife. In characteristic drawings, such as the stomp and dancing waiter, we see the arms akimbo, flying heels, and energized movements that Orozco merely suggests in the shaded figures that convert on his stage. Unlike Orozco's figures, Covarrubias's are fleshed out with grinning mouths and bug eyes that clearly descend from the visual repertoire of blackface minstrelsy. And they recall Nye's observation that the e about the ease with which this kind of animated performance can slide into corporeal qualities. This kind of imagery persisted well beyond the height of the Renaissance and into social viewpoint art and its less political cousin social figuration in the 1930s and 1940s. 
So to take one of many examples I could show you, we could consider Ilse Bischoff's Harlem Loge from 1934, or a related lithographic print on the same theme from 1941. These works depict the segregated balconies that Van Vechten describes. In Harlem Loge, we, the viewer, are given an elevated vantage that grants us visual mastery over this collection of spectators. Unaware of our observing eye, they gaze in delight toward the show below. Their features are illuminated by stage lighting, which exaggerates the planes and protrusions of their faces, producing imagery that verges on stereotype while seeming to offer individuation. And this effect is more pronounced in the lithograph, and it serves as a productive foil to the way that Orozco plays with light and dark contrasts in his print. Unlike Covarrubias, Bishop is careful to rein in the expressive gestures of her subjects. Her point of view reads less as primitivizing and more as appreciative, and maybe even perhaps could be an expression of longing for the kind of intimacy the upper balcony afforded its black patrons. It reminds us that going to Harlem's clubs was as much about seeing spectacular performances as it was about observing what Van Vechten described as, quote, the spirit of frequenters. The lack of tension between the view and the viewed in Bischoff's work naturalizes the disembodied gaze of the artist. Orozco's more emotionally ambivalent point of view in Teatro de Variedades in Harlem marks the spectator's embodied presence through the compositional cues within the scene and calls attention to the viewer's emotional response through what I've been calling the image's depressive mood. So I guess I'm saying there's a mismatch between the spectacle and the kind of emotional mood of the, or tenor of the print that we don't have in something like Bischoff's work on other works that I could show you by Reginald Marsh and a whole slew of artists who also portrayed this kind of scene. Whereas proponents of racial uplift responded to stereotypes peddled by artists and writers by attempting to reinscribe respectability, the cabaret school attempted to despectacularize the simplistic primitivism found in works by Van Vechten or Covarrubias. Shane Vogel argues that writers like Zora Neale Hurston, Nella Larson, and Langston Hughes reworked and loosened the tropes set by white writers through thick descriptions of affect and intimacy in Harlem's integrated venues. By holding primitivizing metaphors and visual spectacle apart, they offered accounts of what it feels like to be colored in the famous words of Hurston. In How It Feels to Be Colored Me, Hurston writes, quote, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background, end quote. In this statement, she characterizes feeling race as a hard blow that hits often without warning when she is in the company of white people. She illustrates this claim by imagining an experience with a white patron at a Harlem cabaret. This man's whiteness is not communicated through a description of his physical appearance, but rather by his staid response to the jazz orchestra. Her male companion's motionless bemusement becomes the, quote, sharp white background that brings her color in relief. By contrast, Herson offers a vivid account of her own physiological response to the music, quote, it constricts the thorax and splits the heart. When the orchestra takes a break, she describes creeping back slowly to the veneer we call civilization and finding her white friend sitting motionless in his seat, smoking calmly, end quote. This description recalls Orozco's son's characterization of the rigid affect of the audience portrayed in his print. In this story, Hurston evokes Du Bois's metaphor of the veil of double consciousness, but reconstitutes it as an oral phenomenon that is ultimately rent by her experience of jazz. As Vogel suggestively argues, quote, Hurston conceptualizes the veil less as a boundary that separates than as a stage where difference is performed and knowledge is produced, end quote. If jazz music and not the performers is the stage through which Hurston registers blackness as difference, it is also a site when, wherein her knowledge about what it means to be colored is produced. Her reading of the music as veil, therefore, does not reproduce the rigid subject-object binary that we see in so much of the writing and visual art chronicling Harlem's nightlife. Rather, it confuses this binary because Hurston is implicated in the jazz performance as a spectator as well. But by shifting the emphasis from the bodies of the performers to how the music they play makes her feel, she generates insights about how colored subjectivity arises and is reanimated or loosened within the limiting and limited prescriptions for white spectatorship and the public life of blackness. The feelings she describes arise at the intersection of harm and joy. Her white companion's wan affect reminds her of how it feels to be colored, 
has been that, that how it feels to be colored has been rendered excessive and even savage, those are her words, by cultural mandates to act white. Working in a textual medium, she is able to loosen her primitivist analogies by prying affect and visual spectacle apart. But how can a visual artist pictorialize how it feels to be colored without reinforcing racial stereotypes? How does one despectacularize color in a medium like black and white lithography that depends on simplified contrasts of black and white and physiognomic cues like those we see in Covarrubias's drawings and Bischoff's woodblock print to render the raced body. In Teatro de Variedades in Harlem, I argue Orozco constitutes light, the ultimate signifier of the immateriality and universality of whiteness as a veil. The white paper becomes the sharp white background against which the spectator's color comes. Representing the bleaching white lights of the stage, these areas of white ground strip the spectacle of explicit physiological signifiers they also render a line of illumination that ostensibly demarcates the spectacle from the spectators. But it is only through this, the effect of backlighting that the spectators come into view at all. In this sense, we might understand the footlights flooding the stage with illumination as akin to the jazz music in Hurston's text. Following Vogel, the bleaching lights in his print are less a boundary that separates than a stage through which difference is performed and knowledge is produced. In reading Orozco's image through Hurston's text, I seek to unsettle the racial assignations of spectator and spectacle. From this orientation, the audience members whose bodies come into view in relief against the white hot lights of the stage are not necessarily white, despite what may seem to be their rigid comportment. If Orozco locates the viewer within a Harlem theater, then we ought to read the audience as at the very least racially integrated and pursue questions about how, where one sat or stood within the theater not only communicated information about race and class, but may also have heightened in each viewer how it felt to be colored. Orozco places us at the very back of a traditional theater, conveying a sense of ambivalent inclusion in the scenario. He, or the viewer, is simultaneously in the theater, but apart from the viewing community. Uh, ultimately, it is the title that places the performance in Harlem. It's, and this is one of the only places in Manhattan in this period where a black and white audience is intermingled and possibly one of the only theaters that Orozco could afford or enter without concerns about how he would be read. Given that what we know about Harlem's integrated theaters, the patrons we see standing behind the orchestra seats were likely there due to their poverty or subordinate racial status or both. Thus the ambivalence that suffuses the print may be the result of the psychic effects of the differentiated space within the theater itself. In 1928, where one sat or stood was in itself a performance of color within the social space of Harlem's theaters. Thereby, Teatro de Variedades structures an affective relationship between spect spectacle and spectatorship. Orozco's son characterizes this affect as rigid and contributes it to white, attributes it to white spectatorship, but following Hurston, I suggest that neither spectacle nor spectator can be so easily categorized. Orozco's son's reading places the artist outside of the psychic conflicts that Munoz attributes to the experience of race in the United States, as a Mexican, his reading implies Orozco was able to observe and comment on US race relations without feeling implicated in them. My reading moves in the opposite direction. I contend that the depressive mood of the image may testify to Orozco's discomfort with the compulsory performance of race as an artist or an audience member. It may even signal an inchoate empathy emerging in Orozco's work as a consequence of his own experiences with US American racism. The dialectic between joy and harm that Hurston associates with feeling colored is more ambivalently registered in Orozco's print. I've been arguing that his lithograph communicates something akin to the feeling that Munoz describes as being brown and down. The depressive mood in Orozco's print may intimate the pain associated with being browned by the United States. And if so, this is a sense that emerges more forcefully and uncomfortably in his gruesome lynching scene. Negros was the last lithographic print he made while living in the United States, and it was made explicitly for inclusion in a short-lived contemporary print group's first portfolio. It was subsequently exhibited by the NAACP and the John Reed Club's anti-lynching exhibitions in 1934, and he based the lithograph on a widely circulated and graphic photograph of a tortured, lynched, and burned body of George Hughes in Texas. These photographs were intended to terrorize African Americans to, and to confirm the right of white people in the words of Dora Apple to quote, look at the brutalized and objectified black body 
But they also circulated in leftist newspapers and in liberal black press to shame white viewers into withdrawing their tacit support for lynching. And Orozco surely encountered them in the latter. The squared off shape of these lynched figures as well as their jointed legs are eerily reminiscent of the shadowy forms that convert on either side of the contortionist on the Harlem stage. And this callback to the earlier scene of variety performance reminds us that visual pleasure and racial terror are structurally linked through the spectacularization of race in the United States. In her analysis of the historical formation of the liberal white subject through what she calls scenes of subjection, Sadia Hartman links popular performance genres to the spectacles of chattel slavery. The construction of subjectivity through the objectification of black pain or performance, she asserts, associates whiteness with the capacity to see and feel and blackness with the dehumanizing spectacle. It is therefore not surprising that white artists so readily exploited the black pain of black victims in their anti-lynching art. Hartman cautions, however, that spectacles of black pain reinforce racial domination because such scenes are as likely to elicit pleasure as they are horror in the viewing subject. The many uses to which lynching photography was put corroborate Hartman's argument. And her insights help to explain why most of the black artists who produced anti-lynching art avoided basing their art on photographic documents of actual lynch victims. Black artists were more vulnerable to the public shaming and terror these spectacles were intended to induce and less able to claim the privileges of universal subjecthood that such scenes appealed to and assumed in the viewer. But what about Orozco, an artist who was neither black nor white? Orozco's focus on Hughes's case may have had a more personal resonance than critics or scholars have assumed. In his archival research on lynching in the West, Ken Gonzalez Day has shown that mob violence and racial terror were national problems. Moreover, in the Western United States, primary targets were Amer Mexican Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. The hundreds of lynchings in the former Mexican territories of Texas and California were routinely covered in the Spanish language press and condemned by high profile Mexican intellectuals whose writing Orozco would have known well. Gonzalez Day notes that vigilante violence against Mexican Americans was likewise widely recorded in the Anglo press of their day, but they have been erased from history and public memory over time. Unlike African Americans in the South and Midwest, Mexicans in the West and Southwest were in a more ambiguous racial category, which was then in formation, because Mexicans sometimes designated an ethnicity, at other times a nationality, regardless of the person's citizenship status. Therefore, Mexican victims might appear in the legal record as Californios, Tejanos, Sonorans, or Spanish. Gonzalez Day's research suggests that the black-white binary that most scholars have assumed when discussing subject-object relationships in lynching photographs and anti-lynching art needs to be nuanced to encompass the more ambiguous racial status of those who were lynched in the West. Returning to Orozco's lithograph, I note that while he based the image on a well-known case of the lynching of an African-American man in Texas, the racial identity of the figures is in fact indeterminate. Having erased all signs of individuality from his figures, Orozco presents them as colored, but lacking the physiognomic signifiers that other artists, such as Paul Cadmus or Itairo Ishigaki, use to draw moral distinctions between white oppressors and their black victims. Orozco's treatment of Hughes's form is more akin to Isamu Noguchi's controversial sculpture, Death, Lynched Figure. Noguchi, a Japanese American, also attempted to departicularize Hughes's tortured body. And like Noguchi, Orozco assumed the privilege of the white artist viewer to look at and exploit the brutalized body of an African American man. But was he able to step into the racially unmarked spectatorship that the liberal white subject position assumes? Or did he feel some sense of being with these victims of racial violence as a Mexican who in Texas might have found himself subject to similar forms of injustice? Orozco's spectacularization of black pain uncomfortably occupies what Gonzalez Day calls the wonder gaze, returning us to the ambiguities around racial performance and spectatorial pleasure that he built into Teatro de Variedades in Harlem. Gonzalez Day reminds us that lynchings were a form of mass entertainment that circulated to thousands more through souvenir postcards. These photographs were some of the earliest mass produced images of the West, and like other popular amusements, they required the presence of a public as participant, spectator, consumer, or paying audience. The presence of the public was what commuted these acts of brutality into 
both mass entertainment and a form of popular justice that helped to consolidate white group identity over and against the criminalized and differently racialized bodies of the victims. Within this framework, Gonzalez Day asks, is empathy really possible with the lynch victim? In his Erased Lynching series, which he began in 2006 and continues to this day, he responds with a tentative yes. He reproduces many of these souvenir photographs in order to grapple with the way that people of color like himself must, quote, look for their past in the dead possessions of others, end quote. He carefully edits out the bodies of the victims so as to emphasize the wonder gaze of the white lynch mobs who were so eager to commemorate their racist acts, often in highly theatrical setups that make the explicit link between racial violence and popular amusements and spectacle um, uh, and make it those explicit. So we consider, for example, the frontier costumes and dramatic posing of the executioners in this uh, image, er race lynching series, Dear Vile Vest, or the way the participants turn to address the camera in his mural scale, The Wonder Gaze, St. James Park, California, 1935. Now, Orozco does not demonstrate Gonzalez Day's sensitivity to the victim, but he does explore the psychic effects of gazing upon spectacularized bodies in Teatro de Variedades in Harlem. Orozco's prints on the public life of blackness provoke questions about how he navigated the US American color line and suggest ways we might interpret his ambivalent and provisional belonging in a nation that insists to this day on the alterity of Mexican Americans. In Teatro de Variedades in Harlem, he puts the viewer in his shoes, so to speak, through the subject position his composition structures. His strategy does not redeem the negativity of the racialized spectacle, but I also don't see it as the self-satisfied othering necessitated by assimilation into normative whiteness. By offering the viewer a perspective from the edges of whiteness, he prompts us to reconceptualize the image in ways that are attuned to what brownness engenders in the world. In this work, I treat Orozco as a brown artist, and following Munoz, I ask that we shift our understanding of Latinidad from static concepts rooted in presumed transhistorical commonalities, such as post-racial conceptions of mestizo normativity, to historically situated processes through which group affiliation is consolidated relationally and in contingent ways. This identity indifference, Munoz argues, is registered through feelings that arise in response to whiteness as a hegemonic identity that is sustained through the pressure to express oneself in normative ways, what is often referred to as acting white. But they also arise in relation to other racialized and ethnic groups. And Munoz was particularly interested in black and brown relational chains, or what he calls brown feeling. So I end with a question rather than a firm conclusion, and that is, does Teatro de Variedades in Harlem perform Orozco's sense of being apart together with other minoritized groups? And what I provisionally suggest is that reassessing Orozco's US-based work as a performance of brown feeling prompts us to reconsider what we think we know about the interwar period of American art and about race, especially as it is expressed in and through visual culture. And here I'm thinking about what Arlene Davila calls the project of Latinx art. Like Munoz, she insists that Latinx art does not designate a unified identity. Rather, as a project, Latinx art seeks historical visibility for heterogeneous communities that comprise the demographic and whose experiences have been systematically erased or misrepresented by both the aesthetic cosmopolitanism attributed to Latin American artists and the Anglo-nationalism of US American art history. Reading Brown feeling in and through Orozco's US-based prints led me to Gonzalez Day's work on lynching in the West which in turn opened the East Coast-centric perspective on Harlem nightlife to a history of the borderlands. And through this geographic reorientation, I place the Great Migration in relation to the dispossession of Mexicans in the Southwest. I treat the racial violence of Jim Crow alongside that of La Matanza and the decolonial ethos of post-revolutionary Renaissance as being with the anti-racist project of the Harlem Renaissance. This kind of reading can be done without reifying the US American color line or reinscribing essentialized notions of race and identity. A reading does not erase the differential relationships to systemic harm experienced by minoritized subjects. But in locating a sense of brown in Orozco's US-based print, I also resist the tendency to misconstrue symbolic acts of ethnic difference by cosmopolitan Latin American artists as mere attempts to act white. Thank you. So it's very dark where I am. I can see people in the audience 
um, and I'm happy to take questions or comments. Um, I don't know if you want to bring the lights up a little bit, <laughs> then I can see you a little bit more easily. I'll start by saying, start by saying this is not working. Is this working? Yeah, it's just the mask. It's just the mask. <laughs> Years in, and I still can't figure out how to be loud enough through a mask. So I know this is really heavy material, and I know people may be needing a few minutes to like figure out how they feel about it. Um, and so um, I'm happy to, to take that time. Um, I'm also happy to elaborate on why I think I need to do this, pro why this project feels necessary to me, if that would be helpful. I'm seeing a lot of yes, okay. Uh, so partly um, what I'm interested in is a couple of things. One is that um, you know, in American art history, we have a dearth of, of um, histories of Latinx artists or of the sort of Latin experience in the Americas because our historical orientation is pretty East Coast based. And nothing that happened sort of west of the Mississippi sort of factors in until sometime well after really World War II. Um, uh, and there is a history there. It's underexplored and underknown. Um, and part of that history is the history of the Mexican artists who were coming to the United States and looking for work because most of the, those journeys began in the West Coast. They began in California, San Francisco, um, New Texas, uh, Los Angeles. Um, and so I'm interested in thinking about ways you can um, disinter our contemporary ideas about Latin American, the distinction between Latin American artists and Latinx artists, and recognizing that many of these artists, when they came to the United States, were on the one hand quite privileged, and on the other hand experienced at different points in their career forms of real racism and racial stigma that they either had to kind of perform to or they had to um, endure. And they write about it and they talk about it, but it's not really a big part of how we talk about this history of ex cultural exchange. And so that's part of what's motivating me to think about that affectively. How did these artists feel? What did it feel like to cross that border and to enter the country? Diego Rivera was involved in, in forced deportations, um, thinking he was doing a good thing. So there was a lot, they were very aware of the violence against Mexican Americans and they were very sort of, they were negotiating that throughout their time here. The other sort of piece, and I see I do have a question, is, um, uh, the desire to think more about um, the relationship between Black and Latin artists. A lot of scholars are doing this for the Harlem Renaissance, and a lot of scholars are doing this, you know, thinking about the profoundly important role of the Caribbean played in East Harlem. And Langston Hughes is writing about this, and Du Bois is writing about mulatto fictions. I mean, there's a lot of, of cross-fertilization happening in this period. Um, and yet this is really not visible at all in the art historical literature. And so thinking about where are those places where we can see this, this exchange happening or this crossing over happening and how can we talk about it in ways that can acknowledge the differential relationships that these communities had vis-a-vis -vis racial harm in the United States. So I don't want to erase that, but also the ways in which they came together. Orozco starts out as a fairly apolitical artist, and by the time he leaves the United States, he's actively participating in the anti-lynching movement. That's a pretty profound transformation for an individual over a short period of time, and it, you know, it didn't happen randomly. It happened because of the communities he was in and what he was experiencing and seeing in the United States. Yeah. Is your program topic considered illegal by the state? Of Florida? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'll tell you I had a lot of trepidation about coming here and talking about any of this. Um, I suspect if I were a public school, high school teacher, which this kind of topic would never come up in a public elementary K through 12 school. It's too, it's too complicated for, for that level. You would be talking about this history in a different way. Um, but I'm sure it wouldn't be legal in that framework um, to be talking about whiteness as a historically constructed um, subject position and set of privileges, probably also not legal to talk about it in terms of uh, talk about racism so openly. Um, I don't teach in the state of Florida. Um, I am here giving a talk in the state of Florida and as a guest, I have freedoms that other people don't have. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of that fact um, and also a little nervous about 
what I might be encountering. Mean, I don't know my audience, right? <laughs> so I don't know who's in the audience. Um, yeah. Hey, um, I'm the director. My name is Elizabeth Ross. I'm the director of the School of Art and Art History, and I thought I should address that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the if you're referring to the legislation we know as HB7, um, that law is not in effect in the moment. At the moment, it has been suspended while we're so it was struck down by a federal court judge in Florida, and it's on appeal um, with the circuit court. And while it's on appeal, it is enjoined. So that law, if that's what you're referring to, isn't effective, in effect at the moment. And even if it were in effect at this, in the moment, it, it speaks to um, situations where people are compelled, say, as part of a course, to attend an event or a talk or a lecture. And everyone, or actually, I actually don't know that. There may be students here. Who are there? Students here who are, who are here because it's part of this. Okay. Well, anyway, it is not in effect, um, and we would have taken that. In. We we when it was in effect, we were taking these things into consideration. But it is what you have said here mm -hmm. is totally legal in the state of Florida at this moment, as far as I know. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Makes me really sad that that's the conversation we're having. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's where we're at. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, I know that Orozco was the primary um, artist example in this um, presentation, but are there any other notable artists that you can think of off the top of your head that have also um, inspired this viewpoint of like viewing themselves racially um, during this time period as well? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think is interesting about Orozco is he seems to be the only one who I think you know, just because of his particular personality and the fact that he had a harder time in the United States than all the other artists that we know of, I think he is more sensitive. Like he's, you know, it's, he's really struggling with it because he is, you know, kind of a lead in Mexico. And so I think it's really offensive to him um, that anyone would be treating him like that. Um, and it gives him insights that he just wouldn't have had otherwise. Rivera and Siqueiros and Covarrubias all experienced similar things. Um, uh, Rivera is so wildly successful and so able to kind of um, leverage exoticness. He like he kind of he's just good at playing the part. He's like, okay, you want the exotic Mexican? I'll be the exotic. One. Here's my gun. You know, I mean, he doesn't he doesn't internalize that. He doesn't offended by that as much. Um, uh, Siqueiros, um, it doesn't happen to him as much because his kind of fame doesn't hit until a little bit later, but they all are making art about this while they're in the United States. They're all doing anti-lynching art in the United States, all of them. They're all involved in leftist organizations that are specifically targeting fascism and lynching, which are in this period seen as together as we understand them to be today. Um, and so, and, and Miguel Covarrubias, who is this really elite Mexican, I mean, his parents were diplomats. He was very light-skinned, extremely cosmopolitan working for Vanity Fair his entire life. You know, I mean, he's just like a lucky person. Even he is being described as a prehistoric man stalking his prey by Ralph Barton, right? You know, so even artists who had great entree into the New York art world and who could mix and mingle very easily and happily and had no financial concerns are also negotiating these kind of um, attitudes that they're constantly having to deal with because of how they're read on the basis of their Mexicanness. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Just uh, thank you so much for this for this really thought provoking um, and powerful and important talk. And I sort of had a, a similar question to Taylor, just sort of following off of that, um, uh, particularly for Miguel Covarrubias, mm -hmm. who's out as someone who does French modernism, know his work depicting Josephine Baker yeah. and some of the works you showed that seem to actually lean more into racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So how would you, so you mentioned him in, in yeah. your talk. And so then if Orozco is sort of feeling down and brown mm -hmm. and then has this potential for empathy mm -hmm. um, with, with these works you've looked at, mm -hmm. then how, um, it's an unfair question, but have you thought more about how yeah. to explain the Covarrubias response of even if he's feeling, um, experiencing mm -hmm. this uh, oppression mm -hmm. in the United States with the, the, with the, the color line, mm -hmm. how that then goes hand in hand with the work output mm -hmm. that sometimes seems to lean into yeah. gross racist yeah. caricature? 
Cobra Beast is such a weird character. I find him really challenging. I, I use him a bit of as a foil in part because um, he is so successful. You know, he's not even an artist before he comes to the United States. He just, you know, he just immediately gets, you know, swept into uh, Vanity Fair as an illustrator and is wildly successful his whole life. And then he goes around and writes all these anthropological, sort of quasi-anthropological studies of Bali and, you know, He's not an anthropologist. I mean, he just seems to be very confident. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And um, I think he published that series of drawings in 1927, right before Orozco makes this print. And I do believe that Orozco is very aware of Covarrubias and very irritated that this young artist who he sees as like not even an artist has gotten into the art world and everybody's celebrating him and Orozco's struggling. You know, he's living in cold water flats financially, he's freezing all the time. He's always writing about how cold and hungry he is um, and angry because he's not getting much traction. And every time he feels like he gets a little traction, he complains bitterly about how, oh, they just wanted what he calls dressed fleas and, you know, they want folk art. And I'm so tired of this. You know, I'm tired of the way I'm being treated. Covribus doesn't seem to have felt that way. He seems to have been successful enough that it never Really, this is why I like Orozco, because I feel like Orozco's sensitivity is there, and the rest of them, it's not really, they're not really internalizing the struggle in a way. They're able to sort of stay above it or beyond it. They are annoyed by it, they have to deal with it, but they don't feel like it's harming their, their being in a way that Orozco, I think, does, at least the way he tr talks about it. Um, Covarrubias is so strange, because some of his images, you know, he's very much credited as kind of the progenitor of this entire visual sort of style, um, this way of rendering Harlem nightlife. It really is, he's, he's kind of at the start of it all. And some of the images are really lovely and sensitive, and some of them are just like shocking to contemporary viewers. Nobody was talking about them being shocking until about 10 years ago. <laughs> so it's a kind of strange thing that only now people look at them and think, wow, that's kind of stereotypical. So I don't have an answer to your question other than to say, I don't think Cova Ruby has ever felt down in brown. <laughs> I think he was racialized, but I think the way that he responded to it was very differently, and that had a lot to do with his privilege. He was protected from a lot of the harms that come from being racialized in the United States by his wealth. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Hi. I want to echo again uh, how grateful I am for you coming and giving this lecture. Um, I was really interested in the works of art that were confiscated at the um, American-Mexican border, and if there was any uh, indication in your research or um, if there was any information about what was confiscated exactly, what happened to it, uh, how was it destroyed, was it cataloged, um, and do, do artists that have their works confiscated in that capacity ever rework them to where we can kind of understand uh, how art destruction as propaganda was working at that time in that location? Yeah, a million really good questions. Um, to my knowledge, and I've talked to lots of people about this, there is no record of what was taken. All we know um, about this, we know from his autobiography, which he wrote later in his life. It's almost like haiku, like he, he's so, it's so brief <laughs> that he doesn't go into a great detail on anything. Um, and there's no record in the, um, in, in the, on the sort of the border archives of this stuff. Because in, in the border at this point in time is still like, it's not the border we know today, and not even the border of 20 years ago. It's still pretty loosey-goosey. You've got to like have a checkpoint, and they go through your stuff, and they ask you some questions, and you move on. So I think his detention, given that he wasn't um, migrating or seeking asylum or anything like that, his detention is kind of extraordinary. Um, and you know, I can think of other examples like Brancusi's bird and you know sculpture being confiscated by U.S. Customs, you know, and not and held forever for being indecent and 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 is it art, etc. This is the only case I know of, and I'm sure it's not the only one, but this is the one I know of where they looked through his stuff and they found what we presume to have been, have been a series, a series of paintings that were a part of his large body of work known um, as the. Um, Oh, my brain isn't working right now. He did a whole series of watercolors and gouache um, paintings about prostitution um, in his early career. And lots of them remain, but lots of them don't. And most people that work on Orozco assume that he was bringing them to San Francisco, you know, to sell. And they had nudes in them. Mexico is a long academic tradition, so the nude is not problematic in Mexico. But in the United States in the 1920s, the nude is still a big problem. And they found all these naked pictures and they just, he says they destroyed them. So he's, you know, I don't know how, burnt them, 
crush them, whatever. But they were confiscated, and he was allowed to go, but he did not get them back. And he never painted them again. He'd moved on by then anyway. It was called the House of Tears series. Um, that's the assumption. We don't know. We, we have no way of really ever knowing, because there's no catalog of his works before then. He was very young um, and not yet a successful artist. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, let's give a round of applause to Mary. Thank you. Thank you.